Just before we look at a very interesting interview with a man named Frank, I want to give you a moral dilemma. It may not be a moral dilemma for some of you, but this is a a family feud that broke into violence at Disneyland recently. Apparently a sister spat on uh, one of her brothers and the brother went berserk and began hitting her. The question I want to ask you is... Oh boy, this is just horrible. The question I want to ask you is... What's the Christian response? And the reason I'm asking it is because I really don't know. Because I've been open air preaching thousands of times, and every now and then a fight will break out in the crowd. I'm talking about every few years something might might break out in the crowd. And so what's my response? Should I jump in and try and be a peacemaker, try and stop any violence? Or should I listen to what the book of Proverbs says about meddling other people's affairs? This is what Proverbs says. He who passes by and meddles in a quarrel not his own is like one who takes a dog by the ears. In other words, you're going to get bitten. So what do you think? What's the Christian response? Leave your thoughts in the comments. This is Frank, a very likable guy, and this is an interesting conversation. Three times I asked Frank if uh, he was going to think about what we talked about, and I think three times he is pretty flippant. And he was very self-righteous. That was the root of the problem, and the cause of self-righteousness is a wrong understanding of God's nature and character, uh, basically idolatry. But his flippancy was something I just couldn't let go. It's like a man, he's in a car with his family, he's going to turn on his engine and drive down a hill to a curve, and we know there's a thousand foot cliff at that curve. And his brakes are broken, and I say, hey, your brakes are broken. And he doesn't believe me. He says, oh, yeah, no big deal. Now I'm going to come back at him and plead with him and plead with him. The root of self-righteousness is very, very stubborn. So when people are flippant about their salvation, it's obvious they don't fear God or where they're going to spend eternity. So I have to go back and get the X of the law out and chop again into that stubborn root of self-righteousness. I hope this is helpful. Frank, do you think it's important to be thankful to people? Always is. It's always good to say I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks for what you did for me. No problem. Are you thankful for your eyes? I'm very thankful for my eyes. <laughs> Who to? To however I got them and how they were made and whatever way they were came to be. <laughs> how did you get them? Who gave them to you? Who made them? Um, evolution, I guess. <laughs> thankful for your hearing? Of course. Enjoy good music? And I love music. I love thankful for your food? Of course. Well, Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do? Thank evolution before your meals and thank evolution when you look at a blue sky and the, and the clouds and the... No, I don't think evolution is a, a physical or some sort of spiritual thing. It just happens through time. I mean, you people adapt and people evolve and yeah. Do you believe in God's existence? I'm great. I say thank I you by, you know, I think by sharing love and, you know, I don't think you have to necessarily get on your knees and pray. I think... You should thank some, thank the universe by helping someone or by doing something good or just. Say thanks to the universe. Yeah. Or that's what's been made. That's like thanking your car instead of Toyota for making it. Do you know what God requires of you in regard to Thanksgiving? To be thankful and to love your neighbor and love your, and love everyone and anything. I think that's what God's about. If there really is someone out there or this God up there, I think that's what He wants and. I mean, I don't know if we have to necessarily, like, always be thankful. I mean, we... I Remember mean, how this conversation started? <laughs> how it's a courtesy to be thankful to someone. Look, if your dad gave you a brand new car worth 60 grand, what do you owe him for giving you that car? You don't owe him money, but you, you owe him something. Some gratitude or some respect. I mean, anything. This is what God requires of you. So listen, because this is the first and greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Have you done that? Have you fallen short of that commandment? Yes, 100%. If that's what it is, I mean, I think I... Hang on, you didn't even give acknowledgement to God a few minutes ago. You just said thank the universe. But this is, this is where I'm going with this. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Yes. Do you realize what you're doing when you do that? Using his name as a cuss word when, you, when he gave you life and hearing and eyesight? Are you a good person? A very good person. How many lies have you told in your life? 
You know what? I'm a very bad liar, but I have told a few. <laughs> Ever stolen something? Uh, when I was younger. Yeah, everything happened when you were younger. We met when you were younger. <laughs> You've used God's name in vain. Now Jesus said, if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? I mean, I mean, you can look at anyone with lust, but I mean, it's just something that naturally happens. I don't mean to, it just happens type thing. Yeah, you know? we can't help it. Like We're like moths to a flame. So, Frank, I'm not judging you. And by the way, I appreciate your honesty and your patience with me. But I'm not judging you. You've just told me you're a lying, thieving, blasphemous <laughs> adulterer at heart. Yeah. And you're guilty of the sin of ingratitude, which yeah. is a great sin when God gave you life, lavished his goodness upon you. If we listed the things that God's given you, like health and strength and freedom in the country and good food, and, and that's what I was like. For 22 years as a non-Christian, I never sincerely thanked God for giving me life or food or health or strength or eyesight. Ooh. So here's the, here's, the big, here's the big rub. If God judges you by the Ten Commandments, we've looked at four of them, on the Day of Judgment, are you going to be innocent or guilty? I think innocent. Why? Lying, thieving, blasphemous, ungrateful, adulterer at heart? Because, I mean, I don't think God's going to look at what you've done in your human flesh. I think God's going to look at what your, well, your heart, you know? I think, you know, I think there's a way that God is going to know your heart and will let me in. I mean, I'm a good person my whole life. I mean, I've done nothing but good, even if it was in, in, the, in the glory of God or not. But Let me just uh, reason with you here, Frank, because this is such an important issue. If you stand in front of a judge and you're guilty of very serious crimes, I mean, very serious and he says to you, you guilty, you say, yeah, I'm guilty, but I want to tell you, I do a lot of good things, judge. He's going to say, so what? So you should. He's not going to judge you by your good works. He's going to judge you by the crimes and the crimes alone. And on judgment day, God will judge you only on your crimes, not on the good works you've done, because he's a God of justice and truth. Well, he's not a very good, nice, kind God. I mean, he's, I mean, I think... No he, criminal thinks well of a judge. <laughs> that is true, but I mean, he should consider our human flesh and the, and the things that we're easily influenced and things that are around us that it may not be our faults, you know, that... Don't try that in a court of law. Judge, I raped that woman, but it's not my fault I was made like this. I was just so tempted by that woman. That's true, but I think it's completely different. I mean... You know what you're trying to do? What? Justify yourself. You're like a little kid with his hand in the cookie jar. He's got chocolate all over his mouth and you're saying, it's not my fault, mum, it's not my fault. I know you told me not to tell you. See, Frank, God gave you a conscience saying so you know right from wrong. So when you did transgress those commandments, you did it with knowledge that it's wrong. And you've got God's promise, if you die in your sins because he's just and holy, you'll end up in hell. And I'd hate that to happen to you. I like you, I care about you, and I don't want to see you in hell. Now, do you know what God did for guilty sinners so we wouldn't have to go to hell? Any idea? Repent. No. He killed himself or he sacrificed himself, sorry. Yeah, God became a human being. Most people don't realize this, but Jesus was the express image of the invisible God. God created for himself a body. The Old Testament says a body you have prepared for me. And he filled that body as a hand fills a glove. And then he gave his perfect sinless life as a sacrifice for the sin of the world. We know that, but we don't know this aspect. You and I broke God's law. The Ten Commandments are called the moral law. Jesus paid the fine. That's what happened on that cross. He cried out, it is finished, just before he died, meaning the debt has been paid. Frank, if you're in court and someone pays you fine, even though you're guilty, the judge can let you go on the basis of the fine being paid by another. You can say, look, Frank, you're guilty. Guilty is sin, but you're out of here because someone's paid you fine. Well, God can let you live forever legally. He can do that which is right and just, extend mercy towards you, even though you're guilty because of Christ dying on the cross, rising again on the third day. What you have to do in response is repent of your sins and trust alone in Jesus, like you trust a parachute. Now you said that you were thinking about eternal life and what happens after you die when I came up and spoke to you. There's a cry in your heart of, oh, I don't want to die. That's God given. It's a will to live. Man, listen to it today and realize the reason you don't come to the light is because you love the darkness. That's what the Bible says. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Neither will they come to the light, lest their deeds be exposed. At the moment, you're like a criminal in the darkness, and the darkness is your um, security. And 10 police spotlights have just come on and showed your criminal activity in the light, and so you've got a choice. You can stay and get shot to death by the police, or just raise your hands and say, I surrender and fling yourself on the mercy of the judge. And the Bible says God is rich in mercy to all that call upon him. So will you think about this, Frank? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's 
okay. giving you a load of information, <laughs> but please think about it because you don't know when you're going to die. I mean, you could sit here and just croak while you're sitting here of a heart attack, aneurysm, killed on the way home. 150,000 people die every 24 hours, so this is deadly serious. And examine my motives. You know why I'm talking like this? Because I love you. No other reason. You know, if I didn't care, I'd just say, oh, go to hell. I don't care. But I do care. And I want to see you saved from death. Do you know what death is? Mm, yes. And do you know what it causes? And I don't mean a heart attack or hit by an 18-wheeler. But why does everybody and everything die? Any idea? And the reason we die is because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. A judge will give a heinous criminal wages. If he's raped three women and slit their throats, the judge will say, you've earned this. You've got an electric chair. You've deserved it. It's your wages. You and I have earned our wages on the side of holy God. Capital punishment, that's what death is. Death is the arresting officer that's going to seize upon you, drag you before the judge of the universe to answer for violating his moral law, and hell is God's prison, and there's no parole, and that's why I'm earnest. There's no way out of hell, no hope in hell. So I'm saying, please think about this. This is a life and death issue. Now, do you have a Bible at home? Uh, yes, actually I have one at home. Are you going to think about what we talked about? Um, I mean, I've thought about that a lot. I mean, growing up, I was involved in church and uh, I was in youth group. I was going to church three times a week. And so what I noticed was that everyone who was in church was not a good and not a good representation of God. And people were doing bad. Our priest was doing was committing adultery. There was so this is a Catholic church? No, it was a Christian church. And now he was committing adultery? Yeah. Man, you should have left that church oh, like greased lightning. I did leave that church. You don't turn your back on God because there's hypocrites. You turn to God. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I don't go to, we, I mean, church isn't somewhere where my relationship is with God. My God, my relationship is between me and my Bible. You know, that's my relationship with God. Church is just somewhere where you're fed, you know, the word. But I mean, after that incident, like I left and like I, unfortunately, I went to different churches and I couldn't find my right church again. But well, listen to this. There's such a thing as a false convert. Jesus called them tears among the wheat foolish virgins among the wise, bad fish among the good, goats among the sheep, and they're going to be sorted out on the day of judgment. So make sure you're genuine, make sure you truly repent, and that other people aren't looking at you and saying, Frank's a hypocrite. Never, never. I've never been, I've, I've, everyone you know, that knows me knows that I am a good person. That I. No, you're not. You're like the rest of us. You're a lying, thieving, blasphemous, self-righteous, unthankful, adulterer at heart. So face it, Frank. I mean, a little bit. I mean, what not a little bit, a lot. The Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. I'm trying to pin the tail on the donkey, put the blame where it's found to say, hey, if you've got cancer, you'll never seek the cure unless you first admit you've got cancer. And you'll never seek God's mercy as long as you think I'm clean, I'm clean, I'm clean. No, you're like the rest of us. Do you look no, upon? Do you look at pornography? I try not to. So you do. So God's seen every sin, and the Bible says every time you sin, you're stored up as wrath. You're an enemy of God in your mind through wicked works. You use God's name as a cuss word. So be serious about your sins. Be truly sorry. Repent and say, create in me a clean heart, O God. And he will. He'll keep his promise. He's able to save to the uttermost those that come to God by him. So, Frank, I thank your patience. I've said some harsh things. And as I said, my motive is one of love and kindness towards you. Uh, sometimes love is, comes in the form of a rebuke because there's a, a seriousness involved and I want to see you turn around and trust the Savior. So thank you for listening to me. Are you going gonna to think about it now? Uh, I think about it all the time, but yes, I'll think about it a little bit more. <laughs> Appreciate that, Frank. Thank you. Thank you.